Lord, oh, thank you for another time your presence. Thank you for the previous teachings. We are looking up to you today. That you teach us your words again. And at the end, our life will be better off. Thank you, blessed Father. In Jesus' mighty name, that we prayed. Amen. You are welcome to today's teaching. My name remains Dio Ojo. We started a series on the redefining prosperity in line with the teachings of the Bible. We did part one and part two. We're supposed to be going to the part three today. But we're going to have a break and take teachings on dealings and doctrine and another one on how God answers uh, prayers. I realized that without taking those two teachings, we might not be able to comprehend or do justice to the third part of that series on prosperity. Because you agree with me that there are manners of problems out there. And one of the major problems we have in Christianity today is not having sound doctrine on giving and prosperity. And the, the body of Christ have been thrown into a mess so much that when you go on the internet, you hear all manners of abuses. And then um, people taking everyone that teaches uh, the doctrine of Christ as charlatan. So today we will look at uh, doctrine and, and dealings. Um, looking at the Bible, you see a lot of uh, instructions, prophecies, laws, teachings that are given to the body of Christ as a whole, and some that uh, are dealings between individuals or dealings between God and individuals. The one that has to do with uh, the body of Christ that's common to all is what we call doctrine. And the one that is a dealing between two people or a group of people or between God and a person or a group of people is what we call dealing. Let us uh, dig in by starting with uh, doctrine. What is doctrine? For the purpose of the teaching, I will define doctrine as um, the teachings, instructions that are given to the body of Christ um, to be observed by all. And um, let's look at what that means in 1 John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. Now I read 1 John chapter 1, I start from verse 1 and read up to 3. That which was from the beginning. Note that that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life not in that uh, verse one that that which is from the beginning and the one that we have handled with our hand verse two for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Three, the last. That that which we have seen and heard declare un, we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Now, let's look at... Um, that passage we have read, if we look at verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, meaning that for anything to qualify to be a doctrine, it must be from the beginning. It must be timeless. It must not be something that just started now or started after the beginning. It must not be something new. It must be something that has been with us from time and is still existing today. You don't uh, modify it. You don't remove from it and you don't add to it from the beginning. And then um, let's give a, a validation to that by looking at what the Bible says in book of uh, Revelation 22, 18 to 19. Revelation 22, 18 to 19. I read, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, 
God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from this word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and for the things which are written, written in this book. Now, that place talking about we must not add to the Bible. The beginning of that place we talked about in First John chapter 1 is the beginning of when this book was compiled, beginning of when God started with humanity up to the time that Jesus left. The things that have been given to us that in the Bible, that's what they mean by beginning there. So when they were sealing it, then John said, nothing must be added to it. That's the Bible that is given to us and nothing must be removed. That is to say, anything that is not contained in the Bible cannot be part of doctrine. It doesn't matter the revelation we have. Even if we see Jesus Christ talking to us and telling us anything, that cannot qualify to be a doctrine because it is not from the beginning. So if somebody says um, he had a dream and he saw Jesus in heaven or saw God the Father in heaven and told him about uh, hearings that uh, were not the way hearings, the first thing we do is to look at it as that thing be with us from the beginning. Since if we cannot find a place written in the Bible, they cannot become a doctrine. It can be a delay between that person who is relaying that to us and God himself. Anything that is new cannot form a doctrine. Now, the second thing we read in that first John, um, first John chapter one, in the verse two of it, we saw that uh, he said the things that were handled, meaning the things that were tested to be real to produce result. We have handled it, we have seen it that is real. And uh, that's to say that if something must be real, there must be something that uh, Anybody can handle and produce results regardless of the race, regardless of uh, um, the nationality of that person, regardless of the tribe, regardless of time and season for it to produce results. So if I take it in America, it must give me result. If I take that word in Nigeria, it must give me result. If I take it in, uh, in Asia, it must give me result. So he said, the things we have handled, that are the thing we are telling you, that is to say, it is the thing that must produce result at all times. Let's see what the Bible says again in Psalm 19 verse 7. Psalm 19 verse 7. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The word of the Lord is perfect. It's certain that the word of the law must bring testimony, must be result. So for you to qualify to be a doctrine, it must be result wherever it is used. It must be result whoever is using it at whatever time we are using it. That's the second thing that uh, qualifies a doctrine. For instance, I've listened to so many African preachers who said that uh, one more partner with a spirit if it must cross certain threshold of wet. Well, if one is in Africa, that may be correct. Because if you attain certain level in life, if you are not supported or backed by spirit, some of your family people, some of the people in your neighborhood, some of the people in your place of work might not be happy with you. And they want to attack you spiritually. So if you don't have a backup of the spirit, they will bring you down. That is possible in Africa. But if you go to other places around the world, that might not be possible. If you come to a place of America or Europe, nobody's looking at you. There is no right you cannot attain and nobody is attacking you. So that is to say that that kind of statement is, cannot be a doctrine because it's only peculiar to African people. It's not general to humanity or to body of Christ. That's why we're saying there that it must be able to produce results everywhere to call it a doctrine. Anything that doesn't produce results everywhere cannot be generalized it cannot be called a doctrine. Now, the third thing that I must do, if we notice that place in verse 3, it says that we declare unto you. Now, if you see the book of 1 John, unlike other books, they will tell you it was written to Corinthians, it was written to Thessalonians, it was written to so 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 people. But in 1 John, it didn't start with who it was writing to, meaning it was written to the body of Christ completely. There is no dealing in the entire book of 1 John. 
It has to do with the complete body of Christ. Say that I declare unto you. So for something to be a doctrine, to de doctrine must be for all. It must be common to all. If God says something to me, and that is for only me, it cannot be called a doctrine. I cannot come out and tell the old world that God says so, 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 because it might be peculiar to me. Like we said in the story of, you must partner with the spirit to cross certain threshold of wealth in life. That's only peculiar to Africa. That cannot become a doctrine that will climb the altar and begin to teach as a doctrine. We can only say some people, we can generalize it. So for something to become a doctrine, one, it must be from the beginning, that is, it's timeless. It's not just coming up now through revelation or through anybody's teaching. Two, it must be for everyone that regardless of your location, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your race, regardless of time that you're using that statement or that instruction or that body of teaching, regardless of the season that you're using it, and it must be for all. And it must be result also. And when it's bringing result, it must bring result to everybody that uses it. Uses it. That is what a doctrine is. Let's see a typical example in the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, who is verse 1 of it. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, note that it's a doctrine of Christ common to every one of us. Let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. He say one of the principles is talking about is the foundation of repentance of dead works. You agree with me that that's common to everybody. We must repent for our dead works. Wherever we are located all over the world, whatever race we belong, whatever time we use it, it has always been, it will always be. And that one is talking about, say, of faith towards God. Faith towards God is common to all too. So it becomes a doctrine. Verse 2, the doctrine of baptism. He say of the doctrines of baptism. Baptism is for everybody in Christ who must be baptized. So it's a doctrine. And lay not of hands. Lay not of hands is anytime you want to transfer anointing or his or do something for anybody, lay not of hands is a doctrine that's common to all over the world. And whatever time. Resurrection of dead. We all believe that everybody is going to resurrect. It's not given to a particular section of humanity, but to everyone that one day will resurrect. And eternal judgment. Eternal judgment too. Everybody will be judged. So that is what they call doctrine. Something common to all. And when we take it, it will produce result. Other examples are if you look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. The Bible says that uh, God told Noah that seed time and harvest time will not cease. Of course, it's so told to Noah, but it was meant for generality of humanity. Because it's so told to Noah who was our progenitor, from who we're starting all over again. Also, the things that were told to Adam are doctrines, because they were meant for humanity who were assuming to be inside Adam that time. Then when Joel was saying that, take, I mean, give, it shall be given unto you, which is the Christian version of the uh, Genesis chapter 8 verse 32, that seed time and harvest time, cold and uh, cold and uh, and winter will not cease. If we use any of these statements, you discover that one, they have always been with us. Two, they will produce results, whoever is using it, wherever that person is. Three, they are not limited to a segment of people. Then we have another one. Dealings are God's strategy for a particular purpose or for a particular time, or for, for a particular person or a group of people. That's what we call dealing. And for something to be a dealing, it will fulfill three uh, requirements like doctrine. One, unlike uh, doctrine, it is not timeless. It is not timeless. It is possible, it was in the Bible, but today is no longer applicable. We're going to see examples. Or, Along the line came up, it was not in the Bible. Along the line came up, but it's meant for that particular time or for the purpose it came up that time. Or in the future, it will still come up. It will be for that particular purpose, not for all the times. For instance, the one we said when somebody said um, it caught a revelation. That revelation is for that time for that person. It's not for the body of Christ. That means it can work for that person as long as it does not violate doctrine that's beginning with us. Let's see a typical example of uh, something that is for that's in the Bible that is timeless, that's not for all times. First Samuel chapter 5, 
verse 17 to 25. First Samuel 5, 17 to 25. Let's read that quickly. Oh, sorry. Second Samuel. No, first Samuel. Second Samuel. 5. Second Samuel 5, 17 to 25. But when the Philistines heard that they have anointed David king over Israel, and the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hood. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Raphim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto them, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistine into thy hands. Now, note that verses 18 and 19. He said, The enemy gathered in the valley of Raphim. And David asked question from God. Should I go and fight them? God now told him, go, fight them. I'll give them to you. The location was Valley of Raphim. And God said he was going to win them. The same enemy, Philistine. Verse 20 now. And David came to Belparim. And David smote them there and said, The Lord has broken forth upon my enemies before me as the bridge of waters. Therefore he came, therefore he called the name of the place Belfariam, Belfazim or thereabout. 21. And there they left their images, and David and his men burnt them. And the Philistines came up again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. No doubt verse 22, the valley of Rephaim. The same place they gathered the first time was the place, same place they are gathered the second time. And that first time God said, go against them, you are going to uh, uh, defeat them. And he did that and defeated them. Let's see what happened in this case now. Verse 23. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, thou shalt not go up, but fetch a complex behind them and come up them over against the mulberry trees. You can see the structure here is different from the first instruction. Yet the battleground is the same. Meaning the first instruction was meant for that purpose and for that time. Why that se this second instruction now is meant for this purpose and this time. Different timing, different uh, instructions. That's what they call dealing. So the dealing for that time is different for the God, how God was dealing with David this second time. So dealings are timeless. I mean, are not timeless They're for a specific season or time or person or purpose. Now, another thing about dealing is uh, not declared to all. Or it's an inspiration to someone. Daily is not declared to all Christians or like doctrine. There's for a particular person or for a purpose, like I said. In that other case, it was David God told that. If it were another person, it's possible God had told that person different thing entirely. We know the story of the woman of the issue of blood. We didn't read in the Bible where God gave instruction or any of the uh, apostles told us that we should touch some of this garment. There was no instruction like that. But yet, that woman felt in her heart that if only she could touch the garment of Jesus, uh, the hem of Jesus' garment. Meaning, for those who understand how God works or uh, how God speaks, it must be an inspiration in her spirit. God telling her, do this, giving her inspiration. So that means that instruction was meant for her to touch that garment. Now, someone else could touch that garment and nothing will happen. Don't forget, in that same story, the Bible said that uh, so many people were trunking Jesus, so many people were touching him, and they didn't get any healing. Only that woman got it. So, it was not a matter of touching garment. It was a matter of inspiration that was given to that woman that if you did this, you were going to get this. She did it, and she got that. Another person doing the same thing might not get a result. That is for that purpose, for that woman. And that story is the story of um, uh, uh, when the children of Israel went, went against the wall of Jericho. God gave them particular instruction. Go around that wall seven times and told them at the seventh time they should shout. Now, that instruction was for that purpose. You realize that that strategy was never used again in all the wars that Israel went for. If they are used the instruction again, if they encounter another war and they use the instruction, it might not deliver to them because it was not given, because, sorry, because it was given for the purpose of Jericho. We see Christians today who don't understand that 
They say they are going around. Yeah, somebody so. says, child seven times, so, so, so will happen. No. It's, it was for that time, even though it was written in the Bible. It's not for now. Of course, shouting is not wrong. Bible enjoys us to shout. So shouting generally is not wrong. But to now think, shout seven times because you already somewhere, they shouted seven times, something will happen, does not work like that. That is a, a dealing. Um, we also heard of case of when children of Israel, God told them that anywhere the feet of their, the sole of their feet tread, he was going to give to them. And uh, he gave it to them. Does that mean you can just stand up any day and be treading anywhere and claiming it? No, that will not be correct. It was for that purpose. It was not for any other person, for the people of Israel. So we should be able to differentiate when something is meant for everybody or when it's meant for a purpose or for a people or for a person. If not, we'll be getting a lot of things wrong. Let's proceed. You understand what we're trying to bring out of this teaching. Then the third thing is that it must produce result for that purpose, time or person. So it will produce result for that purpose. It might not produce result for any other purpose. For instance, Isaac was asked, I mean, Abraham was asked to go and sacrifice Isaac. He did sacrifice Isaac, but God said, don't do that, all of that. We see so many preachers today will come up with that story to want to take sacrificial offering. I'm, I'm, but, I'm buttressing it with this. Now they forgot that it was God that gave the instruction. It was not that Abraham just stood up and went to sacrifice or went to, to or wanted to sacrifice his son. No, it was God's instruction. So if you base your teaching on this now and you tell people to bring sacrificial offering just because you quoted Abraham wanted to sacrifice Isaac, you are wrong. Because it was meant for Abraham, meant for that purpose. It can be a guide to you on the ways God walk. But it's not for you to now use it to want to take sacrificial offering. No. Except God particularly gives you instruction that take sacrificial offering. If we take it based on this passage, you are wrong. Of course, some people might get result, but a lot, a, a larger percentage of people will not get result. I will go into that, how people will get result when we look at our second uh, teaching. I also remember recently I was in a church. And they were talking about the story of Josephat and the three nations that came against Israel. How God gave them instruction that they should uh, uh, raise up choir and go towards the battleground singing. And somebody in that service that day where I was came up and said, them, if people of Ukraine should know this, they could defeat the Russians. And I said, no, that, that is wrong. That's the wrong understanding of scripture. There was no way in the Bible God told the people of Israel that if you were going for war, you should go using choir and singing, apart from that particular instance. So it was not more for a general purpose, but for that particular purpose. Every other time, they didn't use it again. So it was a strategy for that purpose. If you now come up with it, you pick up that place in the Bible and want to use it, you're going to fail. Because... It was not given to you. It was just given in the Bible to let us know God has different strategies. And one of the strategies is this. But it's not meant for you to use. That's a, a delay. It's a dealing. It's God's dealing now with Joseph and Israel as at that time. It's not a doctrine. Another example I heard of uh, some people in Korea, in Korea who gave their life to Christ. And they read in the Bible how Jesus walked upon the sea. And they went walking upon the sea. They sank and they died. You know why? That was the dealing to Jesus. There was no way in the Bible we were taught that we should walk upon the sea. We're going to get into that later. So if there was no way we're giving that instruction as, as, I mean, as the body of Christ, there is not a doctrine that everybody can just speak and use anytime. It is for whoever that thing was given to. So Jesus did it. It was a dealing between Jesus and God the Father himself. That must have instructed him he could walk on the sea. It's not for you and I to come and walk on the sea. If we must walk on the sea, God must particularly speak it to our heart to walk. If not, we will sink. No matter they are never anointing, no matter how close we are to God. Not only that, I heard about a story that happened in, the, in Nigeria, that's Africa, that uh, a man of God came up one day. He read the story of Daniel in the Den of Lion. This is a true life story. 
And he said they wanted to be like Daniel. And uh, told them to open the zoo and went and went into a, a, a lion uh, cage in the zoo. Of course, the lion tore him to pieces and killed him. You know why? That was a dealing to Daniel. It was not a doctrine for every human being. It was given to Daniel for that time. You cannot use it as a doctrine. Now, let, let's see some examples of other examples of doctrines and draw our conclusion and see where races are coming because of lack of this understanding. Look at the story of Elijah and Elisha. Have I caused to correct people on the internet based on this and they were arguing. Arguing because the man of God that told them as stature is known everywhere so they feel that he knows everything. You may be a big man of God and you don't know these basic things and you will agree with me that is why there is rot in our system today. Because the people we we trust to know the Bible so much. Some of them don't even know some things we expect them to know. So the man of God is telling you something does not make it correct. It is possible he has not understood these basic things about, about the Bible. Some of these things are just, um, as he pleases God, he opens some people's eyes to see them. Some people may not see them. Now let's see the story like I'm saying. You must have heard several people talking about the mantle of Elijah. Elisha, I mean, Elijah. So we will say they are looking for for those who are Nigerians, they will say they are looking for the mantle of uh, Babalola. They will say they are looking for the mantle of, um, of Idauza. That's for those who are Nigerians. That the mantle is somewhere. No, that's not correct. There's nothing called the mantle of Babalola. There's nothing called the mantle of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 um, what's his name again? Archbishop Idauza. Why? Now, looking at that story, it's in 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah was to be taken off. And he asked Elisha, what should I do to you? Or what should I do for you? And uh, 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 he said, give me double portion of your anointing. Now, mark that. Double portion of anointing is not written anywhere in the Bible. We heard that only from Elisha for the first time. And that was about the last time the Bible talked about double portion of anointing. So, it was not a doctrine. It was a discussion between two people and God looking at them and seeing what they were doing. God in their midst approving what they were doing. Does not turn into a doctrine. Like I said earlier, doctrine is something for everybody. So when I hear people talk about give me double portion of your anointing, no. God must have given inspiration to Elisha to ask for double portion. So I can as well ask for something more than double portion. I can say give me abundance of the spirit on you, if, that's, if, if that is correct anyway, because I don't want to go into many of that thing. I just want to add to let us understand that double portion was Elisha speaking. And it's not a doctrine. It's a daily between Elisha and Elijah. So it's not a thing meant for the church to be asking everywhere you go, double of, of, of somebody's spirit and make it a doctrine. If we ask, there's nothing wrong. It's a desire. <laughs> but it may never be granted because God didn't minister that to you. Don't forget, I say, so something to be a doctrine is more produced result every time, everywhere. Let's go further. Then, Elisha now said, give me double portion of uh, anointing. Then Elijah told him, if you see me when I'm taken off, then it is yours. When Elijah was being taken off, Elisha saw him and he was forced to drop his mantle when he was going. Then he picked up the mantle. Now, that mantle is just a piece of cloth. And that thing was a delay between Elijah and Elisha. It's not a doctrine for the church. That is why you see that in every other place that God was transferring anointing from one person to another, they never talked about man too. When God was transferring anointing from, from Moses to Joshua, they didn't talk about man too. They talked about lay And there are so many of that in the Bible that there was nothing called man too. It was only mentioned that time and never again was it mentioned. So that mantle stuff that we have taken as doctrine today is not meant for us. It is just to, to let us understand that there is something called mantle. It is to let us understand that God deals in that way. And if he pleases him, he can still deal in that way again. But it's not a thing to turn to doctrine that people will be saying they are looking for, uh, for mantle of so-so-so person. That uh, so-so person uh, mantle is still hanging in the world today. There is nothing like that. There's nothing like that. It's heresy. It's a heresy. 
Now, because of that long teaching, we now hear people say something like, uh, uh, you must have father in the Lord, that everybody must have father in the Lord. Like I said, anything that will make a doctrine that you give to everybody must be given to us in the Bible that this thing is for everybody. It must not be between two people. It does not be something that um, that uh, God minister to one person or God minister to one person. Now, when you look at the Bible, the place specifically that they talked about the Father and the Lord was between uh, most, um, uh, um, what's his name? Um, Moses first and Joshua. That was one. Two, we saw that in Elijah and Elisha. Three, we saw that in Paul and Timothy. Those are the places I think I can remember that Father and the Lord occurred in the Bible. Have you asked yourself that there was nothing like that in Moses? Moses didn't have any father in the Lord. Have you thought of Elijah? Elijah didn't have any father in the Lord. Have you talked about the Paul himself? He didn't have any father in the Lord. Have you talked of people like Jeremiah? He never had any father in the Lord. So how come we came up with the doctrine that everybody must have father in the Lord? It's not Bible. It was not written specifically or said by God or by Jesus that you should you will have father in the law or your father in the law should do this for you if jesus has said your father in law will do this for you it becomes a doctrine but there was no point jesus mentioned that there will be his father in the law there was no point that even god the father when he was dealing with history in old testament mentioned father in the lord that is for general and i've told you of people who never have father in the lord and they live wonderful life what about daniel what about Joseph? Who were their fathers in the Lord? No, God just raised them singly and they became the mighty people that we we'll talk about today. So God is still doing the same thing today. He can choose to give somebody father in the Lord like he gave those other people. He can choose to not to give somebody father in the Lord. For you to come up and make it a general doctrine that everybody must have a father in the Lord is not the Bible. It's not a doctrine. I remember personally, I have a friend that were very close. And that God is raising both of us together. One time when we were in Nigeria, God um, told both of us that we should not have mentor. We should not have father in the Lord. That is going to be our father in the Lord. Is going to be our mentor. And to the, to the glory of God, all that I've learned today, all that I've known today, the dealings that God has had with me today, have always been between me and God himself. Of course, I've been reading other people's books. I've been attending crusade and meetings and programs but there is no spe uh, specific person who is the father in the Lord that I report to and that my friend too there is no specific person who is the father in the Lord that I is referring to what am I saying? Am I saying father in the Lord is wrong? No, but what I am saying is don't generalize it that every man being must have father in the Lord, there was no time Bible taught us that and we must not make it a doctrine then you now hear people say if you don't have a father in the law, you don't have your covering. I think I've answered that anyway. That father in the law is not general. So how can you say we don't have a covering if we don't have father in the Lord? Is father in the Lord our, our covering of God? So if I'm serving God in truth and in spirit, so I will need the father in the Lord to give me covering again. Is human being a covering of God? It's only when you don't have God and you're not working with God in truth and in spirit that you start right, running under the shadow of somebody. If you're already walking in truth and in spirit, do you need anybody to run on that? Of course, if God gives you Father in the law, fine. I'm not saying it's wrong, but don't make it a general teaching. Don't turn it to a doctrine that must have covering our Father in the Lord. If in our generation today, for those of us who are from uh, Nigeria, that's Africa, we know people they talk about, I mean, we someone they call Ayobabalola. We never read of any Father in the law about him. God raised him singly in his time. He did mighty exploit. He never had any father in the Lord. What about even today? There's a man they call Brock Billy Akane. If there's anybody in my little time that walked with God, that God keeps mentioning, that has walked with him in truth and in spirit, that said the host of heaven are celebrating it every time, is Brock Billy, Billy Akane. Among the so many that we think are so mighty, is the one God keeps referring to. Yet, he doesn't have any father in the Lord. I'm not saying Father the Lord is wrong. I'm just saying it's not a doctrine. It's a dealing. You can have, you might not have. Don't make it a doctrine. Now, the issue I want to pick up is anchorship. If 
you look at the story of Ankashi in the book of Acts chapter 19, it was not an instruction given. It was not God at all. It was some people were taking clothes and the clothes and touch Paul's clothes and taking to heal people to cast out devil from people. That is to say, if you understand the Bible, how God works, God must have spoken to them like the story of women of issue of blood, giving the inspiration in their heart that do this, and they did it. That was for them. What God did not give, what Paul did not teach, cannot become a doctrine. So it is wrong now to now think that every time we gather, we must be blessing and cash without God specifically giving the instruction. I'm going to tell us the danger of it later, but I just want us to know that it is not a doctrine. Yeah, yeah. I've heard people that say they produce results. I will answer that later. But let me leave the answer, I mean, the aspect of producing result. That is not a doctrine, and we are doing it wrongly, does not mean we will not produce result. Only that it will produce limited result, it will not work for so many people, and to bring the church to where they are, we are today. People will be questioning us because so many are not getting result, even though a few are getting. We'll get into how God answers prayers, and how sometimes he even answers prayer when we are not doing the right thing. I will know what to do. So that's the story of Ankashi. Ego gives an instruction and says, pray on Ankashi. Fine, it's good. But it does not become a doctrine that we do every time. When we keep doing something every time, it has danger. We'll get there at the right time. So like salt, we see some churches, they use salt. Just because Elisha used salt, we notice that Elisha did that once. That there were so many places when he prayed, he never used salt again. That means the Spirit of God, he must have ministered to him that time to use that salt. That's how it works. It's not that I just came up and used salt. No. So, using salt today, if God hasn't told you to use salt, it's not correct. It's not a doctrine. It's not a doctrine. Or some people use candle. If I funny enough about candle, there was no time in the Bible they talked about using candle. So, I don't understand where they got the use of candle from. Just because the Bible mentioned candle, they become an object to be used. But can you mention a lot of things now? Do you use those subjects just because the Bible spoke about them? No, we don't do that. You only do the things that are commanded. You only do the things that are given as doctrine. We also saw there's a church in Nigeria where uh, that uh, was led by that Ajababalola that I talked about. I think in his own time he was giving water. Maybe God spoke to him about what I don't know. But he used to use water. When he left now, that church continued the use of water. The Bible did not at any point told us that when we pray, we should pray on water. No. So you pray on water now without God giving it as instruction is an heresy. It's not correct. But if God particularly mentioned to you as a person to be using water, there's nothing wrong about that. Like I Baba Allah, there was nothing wrong in him using water. He goes on that spoke to him like that. But for his followers to now took it as a doctrine to continue to use water, that's 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 wrong. That's wrong. That's one of the things that brought us to where we are today. The use of objects. People began to use objects, medium or or whatever to get across to God. Those are heresies. Recently, there has been controversy about one man of God giving salt to another man of God's souvenir. And when he was giving, he was saying something like, anytime you raise this sword, that's heresy. That's heresy. One, that was not done in the Bible. Was done in the Even Bible. That might have been a dealing because it was, must have been for that purpose. Now, that man of God too, it could have been that maybe one day God told him to raise sword and he raised sword and he not turned into something we're doing every time. That's wrong. That's a dealing it's not meant for every time. Only doctrines are meant for every time. And doctrine must be from the beginning. Doctrine must, must uh, bring a um, uh, result everywhere, anywhere, anybody, for anybody. Then doctrine must be for everybody. Now again, there's this man of God that I saw recently just growing and is doing exploit for the Lord. And I was talking about some things in the Bible that are going to be uh, translocating. That's... Uh, you are here now, just appear in another place. We saw that happen to Philips in the Bible. That does not make it a doctrine. He said that the church will grow to a level where it will be translocated. That's not true. It's not true because the Bible never said that. 
it only happened to somebody, like I said, by now I think you understand my drift, that that is a dealing, is not a doctrine. So you cannot turn it to doctrine. You can't be teaching that a time will come, we know God so much, we'll be translocating. No, it has got prerogative to decide whether we're going to translocate or not. It's not a teaching, it's not a doctrine. It's for us to know that there are things God can do. One of it is translocation. But we only allow who he wants to translocate. The means of movement for humanity is physical. You don't translocate. I also heard the same man of God talking about the levels we attain in God. He talked about uh, transfiguration. Of course, Jesus experienced transfiguration on the month of transfiguration. But that does not make it a doctrine. That, that was an experience that Jesus had. And we didn't have any example of anybody that had that experience. And there was no time to teach us teaching and told us that there was going to be trans transfiguration for people. No time he said that. Neither was there any time in the Old Testament God told anybody that you people were going to be trans transfigured, I mean, going through transfiguration. There was no time like that. So since there was no time like that, it cannot become a doctrine. You can only give it as a delay that it is possible God does this. That's how to address such. You can say God can make you uh, go through transfiguration. It's not for you to say it's, a, it's, a, it's a one of the things that will go through. No. It's a dealing. It's not a doctrine. Another one that is so important that I need to drive home here is seeing angels. Seeing angels. When I was much younger than this, I heard a very great man of God in Nigeria saying that if you have been with God, if you have been born again for so so number of years, I have not seen an angel that you are not doing well or you are not serving God well. That's not true. That's not the Bible. There was no way we're told in the Bible that when you pray, you shall see angel. I need somebody to show me that. That when God wants to talk to you, he will talk to you through an angel. There was no time God said that. So how did it become a, a doctrine that must see angel? You can live on earth here and do mighty exploit for God without seeing an angel throw your stay on earth. Why? Because God didn't say we are going to be seeing angels. It is one of the means by which God communicates with us. He has several means of communication. He decides which one to use. And so he can decide not to show you angels throughout your lifetime. That means if somebody is praying and is always seeing angels, it doesn't make him a better Christian than you are because you are not seeing angels. Let's go to the Bible and see what God told us he will be using to talk to us. In John chapter 14, verse 26 then um john 14 26 i think john 6 13 and 14 again john 14 26 first john 14 26 he said but the comforter which is the holy ghost which the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things hear that he said the holy ghost will teach you all things that the father will send who was jesus talking to here he was speaking to people around him, the disciples when we talk about disciples, we're not talking about the twelve. We're talking about so many that he was teaching that time. Don't forget they said about 500 saw him. Don't forget one time they said he sent 70 out. There are so many. But among them were 12 specific ones that were close to him. There were 12. Those ones are the ones that became apostles. But there were a lot of people around him that time that was always teaching. And it was all of them was talking to diverse people, meaning that it's for everybody. That you send the Holy Spirit, it will teach you all things. So the person to teach you all things today is the Holy Spirit. It's not angels. It's not angels. That's the one God has given to us to teach us all things. So if you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit is not teaching you all things, that's the one you can say it is wrong. It's a doctrine that will be taught by the Holy Spirit, not angels. Again, let's continue. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said unto you. So one of the things the Holy Spirit will do also is to remind, remind us everything God as said unto us. Let's see again that same John 16, I think from 13. Listen, he said, How bet when he, the spirit of truth, is come, it will guide you into all things. So the person to be guiding you is the Holy Spirit, not angels. Not angels. But God can decide sometimes to send the angels. But the main person you should send all the times is the Holy Spirit. Let's continue. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak. He's the one to be speaking to you, not angel. And he will show you things to come. He's the one to give you revelation, not angels. What are we saying here? When Jesus was living, what he told us is that he was going to release Holy Spirit. 
that the God the Father was going to release Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is going to be the one to teach us all things, to remind us all things, to show us all things. Another place that he will take of Jesus, he will give unto us. So that means anything that you are getting as a Christian is the Holy Spirit that should give it to you. He will pick it from Jesus and give it to you. Anything you are getting now is from the Holy Spirit, not from angels. However, God might decide to now use angels sometimes. That you are not seeing angel does not mean you are not a good Christian. Good Christian. And that somebody is seeing an angel does not mean make him a better Christian than you are. It's just that God has chosen to deal with that man that way. In fact, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is far greater than the spirit of the ministry of angels. Why? Because Holy Spirit is the one God has given to us to deal with us in that direction. And two, because Holy Spirit is God. Angels are not God. So there's no way the ministry of angels will be greater than the spirit, ministry of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means Holy Spirit speaking to me in my heart. Is greater than me, just as I'm sitting here now. I just see an angel just appear, a mighty angel, just appear ooh, with that fearful appearance. Mm. Or somebody just walk out of the wall and come and talk to me. Mm. The greatest one is the Holy Spirit speaking inside of me. Why? Is the one God has taught us or told us that will be speaking to us. He will be showing us all things, he will be uh, giving us revelation. And again, is God is greater than angels. I know be human beings will like dramatic things. We want to see one big thing just appear from somewhere. We want to see the roof where we are sitting just go off in the spirit. And we just see something just lift us up. So, mm -mm -mm. That's not the Bible. That's not the Bible. The Bible way is the way of the Holy Spirit. But if it pleases God sometimes, it can do all of that. That doesn't make the person saying all of that to be better than the person who the Holy Spirit is witnessing to. I have a friend who has so much uh, about mysteries. Who has, oh God has taught so much about mysteries. He has never seen an angel before. God used to tell him, they say, he loved him from the depth of his heart. Great things. And yet, this man has never seen an angel once. God used to tell him he was going to, or he's going to use him so mightily this generation that he will be known all over the world. Yet, he has never seen an angel before. So it's not about angels. Because God did not give us angels as doctrine. So if you see angel, it's a dealing. It doesn't become an, a doctrine. We must understand it because a lot of even big men of God are making that mistake. Including the one that God is releasing now for the revival that he's talking about. They are still getting it wrong. Talking about manifestation. Talking about angels or there about. The implication of that is that if you are no longer, if you are not seeing angels, and you have been taught that you need to see angels. You'll be discouraged in your Christian work with God. You think God has not approved of you. Before you know it, one voice can now be telling you that God hates you. God doesn't like you. If he likes you, why is he not talking to you with angels? Why are others saying that you are not saying? With all the days you have been praying. With all the fasting you are doing. You get discouraged. So this is one of the implications of some of the things that we teach. Angels is not the means of talking to us. But the Holy Spirit. Now, another one I have to drive home very uh, uh, strongly is about prayers. Let's see Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, before I say what I want to say. Matthew 6, 5 and 6. Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. And when thou pray, note that, when thou pray, note that there, God didn't give name. It was not taken to one person. It was talking for everybody. So that makes it a doctrine. That means it has been since that time, it is still today. That means a Christian should pray. That's how to recognize doctrine, spoken to everybody. Say, where thou pray, thou shalt not be as hypocrite are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the street, and they may be seen of them. Verily I say unto you, they have, they have their reward. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, it's talking now. Say, when you pray, Note there, when. He didn't give the time we are going to pray. He just said, when you pray, enter into thy places. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in, which is in secret. And thy father, which said in secret, will reward do openly. Let's go to some things about. I hope you understand what we are read. The first thing we are going to take there is prayer uh, uh, time. The time for prayer. 
Now in those two verses we read, said, when you pray, it didn't tell us time to pray. It didn't tell us. That means you can decide to pray one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. Anytime you want, you can pray. It's when you pray, God is not an author of confusion. Now we have people who now tell you, and I know it has been with us for long, that when you have night VG, it is it is it's the it's, it's more far more effectual or it's double in, uh, in uh, this thing than uh, 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 where you are not doing night VG. That's not true. That's not the Bible. It's not the Bible. It does it, it doesn't matter who has taught us that. It doesn't matter for how long that heresy has been with us. But it is not the Bible that night VG brings more result than people don't do night VG. Let me open your hearts to this. One, God is not a, how will I put it? It's not a, a, a Confucianist, like I said. And he doesn't prefer one person to the other. He calls all men to himself. Now don't forget that God knew that a time will come a humanity race that we are going to have people who will be walking in the night. Let's assume you live in Europe where a lot of people walk at night. So when will you pray? That means God will not be answering your prayer. Or your prayer will not be answered like people who are not working at night. That means God that made you disadvantaged just because you are working. Or, or how? Because somebody who is doing night jobs can never have night to pray. It's his place of work. And um, like I said, anything we are saying here that must be doctrine must be universal. It must be acceptable everywhere. I know in Africa, we can be in a place of work and be praying at night because we don't take our work seriously. And that's one of the reasons Africa is where it is. In Europe and the Western world, once you're on duty, you don't have time to do another thing. You face your job, so you can't pray. So somebody in Europe now, who all he does every day in his life is now duty. Will he now have time to pray at night? Has God not made him disadvantaged just because he's living in America or living in Europe? Two, is God stronger at night than in the day? Because the person that answers prayer is God. It's not... It's not the witches you are praying against that matters. It's God who answers prayer that matters. You can pray now in the morning and God will be dealing with witches at night. Don't forget that witches too, they fly anytime. And the devil can do anything anytime. If witches know that it is the night that you used to pray, can't it come early in the morning or when you are sleeping? If, if we claim it's because witches fly at night. Okay, let's assume you pray from 12 to 2 a.m. Won't the witches be intelligent enough to come around 4 a.m. after you have stopped praying? Or does it mean because you want to pray against witches, then you should pray throughout the night, you should pray from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. because they can still fly anytime. In fact, we see some of them flying very early at dawn, around 6 a.m. That's to tell you that it's not about the witches you are praying against, it's not about the result you want to get, it's about God who is answering your prayer. Since God is constant and He answers prayer anytime, the time you pray does not matter. It is not about you are praying again. It's about the one who answers your prayer. God time of pray. God time of answering prayer is not fixed. Is any time we cry to Him that He answers. Another point is that, like me now, for instance, I live in America. My family is in Nigeria. Let's assume we want to do family prayer, and um, the timing, the the uh, the, uh, the timing in Nigeria is different from that of America. So, which person's timing are we going to choose? My wife, who is in Nigeria, midnight, which is 12 midnight, is my 6 p.m. here. So whose time are we going to choose? To her, it is prayer at night. To me, it's prayer in the evening. Or if I choose my own night, to me, it will be night. To my wife, it's going to be morning prayer. So whose one are we going to choose? What am I trying to say? The time of prayer does not matter. What matters is when you pray. Of course, we know that when you pray in the night, it is better, not because it's a doctrine, it is better because, one, there is no distraction. No, if you are the one that has children, there is no child that will come and be knocking at the door, there is no friend that will be calling your phone, there is nobody distracting you, you pray at night. Two, if you are the type like me that likes sleeping, then when I wake up, so I pray. I start my prayer by 3 a.m. I can't remember when last I prayed by 12 midnight or 11 p.m., or 1 a.m., or 2 a.m. Okay, 2 a.m. I do sometimes, depending on when I sleep. But most times, I either start from 2 or I start from 3. Uh, from 2 or, or 3 and I start. When I wake up to pray, I'm always refreshed because I slept, I've rested. 
Now, don't forget my soul and my spirit are living inside my body. So the condition of body will determine how my soul and spirit will react. If I'm well refreshed, the likely is that I can pray more. I can pray, I can be relaxed when I'm praying. So I develop the habit of sleeping, waking up, and praying. Then I won't sleep off. I'm at alert. I'm, I'm awake. Someone else might make his own midnight. He wants to do his own prayer. He doesn't want to wake up, doesn't want to disturb himself. But I believe why people do midnight sometimes is because when you sleep and wake up, you are refreshed. Not because it is the time God answers prayer. That's one. Two, that I want to uh, point somebody told me one time is that Jesus pray at night. Yes, I told you here that even some of the things Jesus did were dealings. They were not doctrines. Anything that Jesus didn't teach as a doctrine is not a doctrine. But if Jesus did that thing and it's not taught by him, then it's not a doctrine. It's a, it's a dealing that Jesus himself had. For instance, we know that Jesus prayed in the morning, or and he, sorry, he prayed at night. But there was no time Jesus told the disciple, even when they asked him, teach us to pray. There was no time he told them, pray at night. He only taught them, when you pray, say, our Father, hallowed be thy name. That's what he told them. He never at any point said, when you pray at night, when you pray in the morning. It means Jesus praying at night was because that was the time that was convenient for him. That was the time it was not going to be disturbed. That was this time it was not going to be distracted. That's when he chose to pray at night. Another thing we we okay, let me quickly say this. I saw a man of God, one of the big man of God I, I listened to also in Nigeria talking about time of prayer. He now said the one angel appeared to Peter 12 noon, one angel appeared to Kalenos 9 a.m., one appeared one angel appeared to somebody 3 p.m. He now made a daughter out of that. If you want to get his all pray 3 a.m., pray so. That's not true. That's not true. I've told us that God is available anytime. I've told us that God is a God of everyone. 3 p.m. in Nigeria is three is 6 p.m. in America. All of that, we have different time zones. So God cannot condition to time to a particular time because we have different times and God does not change. God is not less powerful at social time and more powerful at social time. God does not answer prayer in social time more than social time. Mm, that's not the Bible. If the Bible said hour of prayer, it didn't at any time told us that Jesus told them that there's hour of prayer, or God the Father spoke to anybody about our prayer, those people must have made it by themselves hour of prayer at their convenience. It's not a doctrine. Now, the hour of prayer at that time used to be 3, I mean 12 noon, 3 p.m., 6 p.m. Can you do 12 noon now? Who to go to work? Can you do 3 p.m. now? Who to go to work? Can you do 6 p.m. when you are just coming back, you are tired? It's not possible. So, so somebody is going to come up and be teaching us that uh, this is the time you see angels. This is the, that's not true. In fact, if you, if you pray in the afternoon, you can see angels. <laughs> you can see angels in the afternoon. It's your God to just uh, take your, uh, what do you call it, consciousness. And you go into the sphere and you see angels. At least I've been uh, in a class before when I was still working. And they were teaching us something. And I sat down. And I drifted off and I saw something. <laughs> Bro, people were there and I saw something. The men of God that minister sometimes and they say there's something. They are seeing something. They are seeing angels in broad daylight. They'll be teaching in, 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 in crusade. They'll be teaching somewhere and they will tell you I see angel now. In broad daylight. So seeing angel is not limited to in the midnight. You can see them anytime. God talk in the midnight. You can see them anytime. God talking to you is not limited to night. You can, God can talk to you anytime, anywhere, any day. So there's no time for prayer. Then pray, prayer and fasting duration. People talk about you must pray for 10 hours. Must, if you want to be a good Christian, pray for... That's not true. That's not true. It's not true. When Jesus said, when you pray, he didn't tell us how long we should pray. He didn't tell us how long we pray. Why? God knew that some of us are going to be men of God. And if you're a man of God, that was your area of specialization. You will likely pray more than somebody who is going to be an engineer because an engineer will go to work. While you your own work, it will be doing spiritual thing. It's your work to be doing engineering work. You can't pray the same way. It's not possible. So a man of God cannot be teaching people now. So if you have not speak a talk for 10 hours, if you have not prayed for 10 hours, how will a man who is going to work have 10 hours to speak? Except it's, a, it's on holiday. Well, if it's on holiday, there's nothing wrong in that. 
but it must not become a doctrine telling people you must pray for so so long you must pray for so so time you must pray for so time why because there are different functions and purposes why god created us it might be somebody who is he is so busy in his place of work might not have up to four or five hours to pray but you you are a pastor you have time you can have four or five hours to pray and if you have read the story of uh, matthew chapter 20 when the bible said the husband man went to hire laborer he said some they work for 11 hours some work for for i think um three hours some work for six hours some work for nine. he gave them the same thing god doesn't reason the way we reason sometimes my one hour before god can be six hours of another person depending on how busy i am i remember when i was coming to america i used to pray long personally when i was coming to america i was like god how do we handle this thing say i should go to america i hope you know in this place there is no time for some of these things and what he told me is that don't worry son that it was aware and that um if it's what time can afford me is is one hour that will be okay with me Please get me right, a disclaimer here. I am not saying if time can afford you to pray more than one hour, you should not pray more than one hour. I am not saying you should not take time off your work sometimes to find time to pray and to be with the Lord. Because having been in the West, I've discovered a lot of people are just lazy about the things of God. They want to walk, 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 no time for God. They accumulate time, free time that they can use to do retreat between them and God, they will never do it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, we must not make doctrine out of how long we should pray. Maybe Jesus said in one place, he said, can't you pray with me for one hour? Maybe a Christian, we should be able to observe to one hour. I might be okay with that. But anything, so that we can be strong. But to say, you said, everybody must pray three hours, well, that's not the Bible. That's not the Bible. It depends on the time, availability of, availability of time, and the kind of work that you are doing. And that thing is prayer result. Prayer result. Some people say, I remember I was in uh, one ministry. He said, if you fast for 40 days, you are going to see visions. It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. You can fast for 40 days, you won't see anything. You know why? It was when Jesus was telling us when you pray. He didn't add to it that when you pray for so-so time, you will see this, you will see that, you see vision. It's not true. You see, some of the things you might think they are minor things. They are breaking heresies. They are discouraging so many people from praying. They are feeling that they are not getting results. Now, you tell somebody that if you fast for 40 days, he must see angels, he must see vision. I is not seeing vision. He will be discouraged. He want to do it again. Say, oh, the one I've done, what has it, what has it uh, profited me? We must be careful what to teach. And that's why a lot of people are running away from church because they are not getting results what we're teaching. We must be very careful. Everybody has his own experience. Dealings are different from doctrine. When we are speaking about doctrine, you can generalize. But when we are talking about dealings between people and God, we don't generalize. We just say God can do this. So it's not bad. It's general to everybody. Now, because of this, a lot of heresies in the body of Christ. Let me give you an instance of what happened to me one day. There was this big uh, ministry in Nigeria that I went to fellowship. The man said the church was going to be weather 30 something and God was going to be moving and the anointing be God will be imparting people. So I went there. I wanted to be imparted. And one day we went to the altar, we we're praying, the main altar, big church of uh, many uh, of big uh, whatever. And I was praying. And I'm the type that when I'm praying, I sob sometimes. When the power of God comes on me, I will sob. So I started sobbing around the altar. And the woman was looking at me. At a point, the woman tapped me. He said, Bishop, as Papa has told us not to cry again, that God has done it. Oh God, if you have had that experience before, you understand what I'm saying. The spirit just left me immediately. I couldn't continue. Why? This woman has not been taught that there are things we call doctrine, there are things we call dealings. Doctrine is general, but dealings are peculiar to people. And my dealing might be different from yours. That your bishop is not experiencing sobbing does not mean people don't sob when they are praying. And that I'm experiencing sobbing does not mean that everybody sob too when they pray. Because I've heard another man of, man of God recently who said, if you are praying and you have not sobbed, then you are not connected to God. 
Your heart has not really yielded to God. That's not true. In fact, I have a friend that is so close to me, like my blood, I mean like my twin brother in the Lord, who God is using mightily. I, he told me I has never sobbed before in prayer. <laughs> if I did, he told me I was shocked too, because initially I thought that once you are ascend in the Lord, you start sobbing. The man said he has never sobbed. And God is using mightily, and somebody who is, who's loved the Lord, it's not whether he does, he loved the Lord mightily, greatly. So what are we saying? Bible didn't tell us that when we pray, we will sob. So don't turn it to a doctrine. Make it a dealing that it is possible. This is one of the possibilities. That's how we put it. One of the possibility. Don't say it's a possibility. Now, let's go to the difference between doctrine and dealings. To avoid making the video too long, we have decided to divide it into two parts. Watch out for the second part to be released on January 28th. Thank you for watching and do not forget to subscribe if you have not done so. Like and share widely. Stay blessed.